You didn't sound very specific. What did you think when you first read that? I'm putting you on the spot. When you first read that, you thought, that's from the Bible? <laughs> I did. It did, yeah. It doesn't sound very doesn't sound spiritual. Right. Like, people are going to die. That's just the way to deal with it. And then, Will, he sings, if there's a reason why I'm still alive after everyone dies, I'm willing to wait for it. Which is a little more spiritual, so Hamilton is better than the Bible at spirituality. That's the lesson today. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to make a deal. Um, first half of this sermon is, is kind of deep. And when I first was in my preaching class, I was always way too deep. In fact, they even uh, my professor made fun of me for always using big words like existentialism. Uh, but the first half of this sermon is existentialism. Um, so if, if you're interested in that, um, because what could be more interesting than why we're here? Awesome. Um, if that's not where you are at today, here's the deal. Um, if, if that word makes you roll your eyes, just hang on there. And I'm going to put flesh onto that idea. We're going to take an idea that's a little, woo, and then we're going to put flesh on that, um, and we're going to show how the questions of life can get lived out, often really well, at the end of life, when you've waited for it, when you've been wanting, wanting those answers. If there's a reason for why I live, let's, let's, let's be existential, and then let's answer that question with one of our friends from here in town. Okay, so, um, so what does my life mean? D did I map in my life to this point? Those are pretty much the same question, but they're from different perspectives. One's kind of here and going out there, the other's from the past. But what's the point of all this that we're doing right here? What legacy am I leading? Same sort of question. One forward, one backward. Job and Ecclesiastes, the two scriptures we've read today, as they wrote, both um, sort of as, as younger men, that's an important detail, as they wrote, they were concerned with those first questions. What is the meaning of all this stuff we call life? And their answers, not very satisfying. But we've all had moments like this, I'm sure, where you feel like, well, what can I do? What can I do with this? Whatever I do seems not to matter, so maybe nothing matters. What is the point of all this? How can there even be a point if I can't find a point? Very cheery, very spiritual stuff today. So Job, if you know his story, he's asking these questions and not coming up with a good answer um, while he's living out through real suffering. I mean, it's just a wave of bad thing after bad thing after bad thing. People die, his wife leaves him, his friends are terrible, they don't support him, he gets sick. So I kind of get it why he can fall into that sense of emptiness about the world. Some of you have landed there after trying over and over to find meaning or to make meaning in a world that feels so cold and so distant. So for Job, I get his despair. I think we can, we can give him a pass on that. But Ecclesiastes, who probably the only thing you know him by is that song by the birds, to every season. Yeah, you did it even without me doing the right note. Y'all hit it. Yeah, we know that. But if you want to picture Ecclesiastes, he's kind of he's kind of wearing a, like a black turtleneck, and he's got a long, skinny cigarette, and he uses words like existentialism with a French accent. Um, he is not suffering. There's nothing about his life that's suffering. He's doing fine. But he's in this self-perpetual loop. Oh, it's all meaningless, meaningless so I'm not going to care about it. And because I don't care about it, oh, my life just doesn't really matter. And because life is so cheap, I'm not going to engage. And because I'm not going to engage, I can't find what matters in the world. So I don't really feel like there's any reason to go on. And that just goes on and on and on for Ecclesiastes. And certainly some of us have had flirtations with that sense, with that nihilism, where it's so hard to even see a point in fighting the fight, where the world is so indifferent to our dreams and our hopes, where our lives seem, seem so devoid of impact, much less of a destiny, and we land somewhere near there. Maybe there's just not a point to my life. Maybe there's not a point to the whole thing. So maybe I should just give up and focus on eat, drink, and be married. God says it's okay. I'm supposed to just wear nice clothes and put on clothes, right? Some of us have landed there, maybe for a season. Unfortunately, some maybe for, for, for longer than that. And sure, there's times when an optimist responds. Sometimes I get to be the optimist. Sometimes you get to be that for me. You say, hold your head up. Keep on working. Let's celebrate the progress. Hold on to hope. It matters to that little starfish. You know the starfish story? You know the starfish story? It matters to the little starfish as you threw it back in. And you hold that smile as long as you can to be the optimist. But just as often, some of us, from what, whatever our suffering is, from our sense of the world slouching toward chaos, yeah, but what does it mean? What's the point? Because I don't know. Because I feel so broken, so beyond repair, so without order, so tragic, so unjust. I, I just don't know what to do. And we come to Ecclesiastes looking for help, and he says, yeah, that's life. Sorry, that's life. 
Now you want him to answer the question better. You want him to get to a point where that feeling you have, that lack of feeling, is not a landing place. It's not just where you feel forever. Uh, but you're not alone. You're on a path. You want him to say you're on a path. We want the Ecclesiastes to say, don't get stuck there, but trust me and trust God that your sensitivity to those places of despair, that will carry you through. We want a sort of hopeful response. He doesn't get there. We, we want that. God, why does it have to be that way? What, what happened in my life that it has no purpose, no destiny? Which I suppose is a prayer. Wanting that. And here's my hope for a redemption. Wanting that better response. These um, writings seem to be from a younger Job and a younger Ecclesiastes. Um, what do you think they would say if they got older? And I don't mean just older as in wiser and more experienced. I mean, what do you think Ecclesiastes would say to his younger self when Ecclesiastes is at the end, uh, ready to die, when he's able to survey what his life has mattered and, and see more of the active hand of God? How would their perspective change when they can add up all the tally marks of what I've done for the world and where the world is going. And maybe they would just be more ossified to the void, but maybe they would find a sense of God moving the world toward love. And Job comes to a place. We know we read Job 14. If you keep going, Job comes to a place. He's so frustrated. Nothing's spare. He's like a little kid. Nothing's spare. And God says, yeah, nothing's spare. You're not in control. Deal with it. And Job says, oh, oh, I'm not in control. Oh, I, can't. I can deal with that now. Okay, I'll keep moving. Ecclesiastes really never gets there. He knows the world isn't fair. But all he ever gets to is death takes us all, and that's all there is, so you might as well obey God. Which is not very redemptive. But here's my hope. Somewhere, my hope is that we get frustrated with that answer. And the fact that we could listen to Justine and say, that's not very spiritual, that's not very godly, that comes from a place in our hearts that is so close to the heart of the world that we know there's a better answer. Ecclesiastes just didn't have it. That call for redemption is itself redemptive, and I think you want, to, you want Ecclesiastes to ask these questions, get wiser, find the world a better place, and you want him to show you if you keep trying to do your best, the world does get better. You want him to say, okay, given this messy world, the point, not eat, drink, and be merry, the point is to love one another. If the world is messy, love one another. That makes more sense to us. Even if we get stuck in the cold, we know somewhere, somehow, from the depth of our being, that love is a better answer. Amen? Amen. Love is a better answer. When I ask, what is my purpose? It's love. When I answer, what is my legacy going to be? I hope it's love. The same question from different perspectives. Jesus is always answering love. And for Ecclesiastes, unfortunately, he had not heard Jesus yet. They come in different order here. But Ecclesiastes, it's vapor. The Hebrew word is hevel, H-E-V-E-L, often translated as vanity. So maybe you heard the, your translation, all is vanity, vanity of vanities. It's, it means that because vapor is people who uh, try to make a big thing out of something that's really empty. And we do this all the time in our life. We think, oh, that's really important. No, it's not. We think, oh, that thing on TV, really, that's the meaning of life. No, no, it's not. We think this thing that really matters to me right now and won't matter next, really important. No, it's not. It's just vapor. It floats away. Ecclesiastes says, that's vapor. We want to then say, Jesus, love is what has substantial point to this world. So God, I pray for that transformative love for all of us. Um, and I pray that we really don't even just get straight to the love. I, I, I genuinely pray that we all have to sludge through that frustrating question so we can really find the meaning of that love. Maybe now, maybe at our, our deathbed. God, I pray that we can personally and as a society find the thread of love that founds it all, and shapes it all, and points our lives where they should go. And here's the wild thing. As someone who admittedly falls into a trap of frustration and impatience, and I want to demand that that love happens now, and when I, and when I get in that place, I dig my pit even farther in my demands, it, uh, I still believe, even through that, I still believe that God answers that prayer and shows us love. And here's why I believe that. Because a couple weeks ago, I went to hang out with Barbara Lawler. Some of you are not members of this community all the time, and you don't know that Barbara Lawler has given her life to telling the stories of our town, of our people. She hates to have the story told about her, right? So we're going to tell the story about her now, because we can't, because she's not here anymore. But a couple weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, I went to, uh, to, to talk with her. Have you ever seen Barbara Lawler sit down? No, no she doesn't sit. She's got to move. So, so, we, so we couldn't sit. We had to move. Um, have you ever seen Barbara Lava without a camera? 
you know? So we had to take a camera. So we went walking with a camera. And uh, she's pretty frail, so every time that you know, I would catch her from falling down, she would say, why do I always have to catch you, Hanson? And, uh, and then we would walk a little farther through the tree. We would stumble this way, stumble that way. We talked about the town, its history, its future. She still cares about the future of our town. We talked about the things that matter, the things that were not Hevel, the things that mattered to her, her forest and how well mitigated it is. We talked about her sickness, which was not as well mitigated. We talked about God, which can't be mitigated. But the most memorable part for me is when um, I just asked her straight out, she's a pretty tough lady, so I just said, so at the end of your life, what's your lesson? What would you learn? What's the point of it? Give me your legacy, Barbara, so I can better understand my purpose. Tell me from your space what I need to know from my space. Young Job said, there's no lesson. Young Ecclesiastes said, we don't matter, so just do your best. But old Barbara Lawler, this is what she said. And I, I wish I could have just gotten every word down exactly right, but I didn't. So I'm just, I know she said six things in a row, and I tried to remember them all, word by word. This is the best I got. She just ripped these off right in a row, so I'm just going to try to just say them, and then we'll get to them. She said, be thankful for your blessings. Be kind to people. Do more for the people you love, more than you think you should. Don't get, hang up, don't get hung up on petty things. You know, I should shake her head. Ride your horse and answer your questions when you can. Be thankful, be kind, do more for the people you love than you think you should. Don't get hung up on the Hevel. Ride your horse and answer your questions when you can. That's Lawler's answer to Ecclesiastes. That's her advice. Looking back on a legacy, looking forward to a world that still has love. And I told her, um, Harper, you just wrote my sermon. <laughs> and she said, no, no, that's your job, which makes this ironic. Uh, but then I said, so I said, Barbara, you wrote my sermon. It's a great sermon. She says, no, it's too twittery. Uh, which it is, it's aphoristic, it's just like six times you put them on Twitter. Um, she, she loved relationships and, and stories and, and pictures that told stories, but her six points really, really does a lot to summarize a life. It, young Job wasn't wrong, we're all going to die, that's terrible. But the Gospel of Lawler takes that and says we're all going to die, and the sooner we face that the better, because <coughs> we can be really thankful now when we recognize and Ecclesiastes, not completely wrong either. The world is full of a lot of meaningless junk. And most of it, I am powerless to fix. And I'm too impatient about my powerlessness. And I blame God when that falls apart. And that can turn into a hopeless spiral. But the Gospel of Lawler takes that and says, yeah, you can't fix all of it, but you can be kind. You can make the world meaningful by loving people, which is a start. The Gospel of Lawler says you don't have the power to fix it all, but do more than you should for the people you love. I love that because it implies something both personal and transformative. As though if we were to love people the way Jesus loves them, we will turn over the whole world to stand up to those who are oppressed. She says not to get hung up on the petty things. Um, and the way she said it is though, like, well, do get hung up on the things that matter, like a community or a forest or whatever things matter at the end of life. I don't think Ecclesiastes had a horse that Barbara would have told him to go ride one anyway because that's fun. And her last legacy, as she told me, was to answer the questions when you can. Kind of a haunting thing for someone who lived only about eight more days. I'm not saying that Barbara is necessarily wiser than Ecclesiastes, but she has a better perspective. It only comes at a thoughtful ending. And as we all in our different time, our different ways, with our own experience and our own lessons, as we find our eventual walk to that point and wonder what our life has meant to the world, maybe after a life of questioning whether it had any purpose, I hope we can land somewhere with her confidence. I hope we can face down the fears of summation and hear the gratitude from the universe 